is who we think. Okay, okay, thank you. First, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Rifeng Wang from ARM Open Source Software Team in infra Infrastructure Networking Segment. I mainly work on the DPTK project and maintain DPTK on ARM. Okay, it's my pleasure to share the state of DPTK on ARM architecture. Okay, here's the uh, agenda. Uh, first, I will introduce uh, some brief of DPTK and then talk about the general status on, on ARM architecture. And uh, then we will take some time to talk about the architecture features that are enabled uh, in DPTK. And the last, there are some more features that in development. We will also talk about talk about that. First, uh, DPDK is Data Plane Development Kit. It's a framework for applications in networking field that allows to uh, access raw packets from from the user space. Okay. Uh, the project was initiated on uh, x86 and with the contributions from the community. Now it evolved to have multi architecture support and can run, uh, run on a variety of CPU architectures, including ARM. The majority of uh, DBDK runs in user space. It bypasses uh, the kernel stack. So it's called a uh, faster path. Okay, uh, so let's look at some use cases. Where where is DBC <coughs> used? Uh, there are many many open source projects that uh, consume DBDK. Here I put uh, uh, the projects into categories. Uh, one type of application is traffic generator. These applications work as uh, tools for traffic test and uh, measurement. And another popular use case in software uh, is software switches, uh, such as OpenW switch and uh, Fido VPP. Uh, these virtual switches, switches. have the option to use DBDK as the I/O. And this supports packet switching in user space. Other use cases including uh, integrating with networking frameworks. Integrating with networking frameworks and the uh, protocol stacks that work in use user space. Uh, as part of building blocks, DBDK also enables the uh, telecommunication industry to implement uh, performance sensitive applications like uh, the 5G uh, wireless base stations, equipment for mobile networks, and uh, also voice in purpose built and uh, cloud native form factors. Okay, uh, next let's take a closer look into DBDK. Uh, it includes two main parts, the pool mode drivers and the various libraries. The drivers are in user mode and the works in pony mode. They have the support of uh, Ethernet interface card as well as some other accelerator hardwares. And the libraries provide the functionalities, uh, helps in packet processing. Uh, there are libraries for packet classification and uh, distribution, and also uh, metering and so on. 
OK, next, uh, uh, let's look at uh, uh, the novelty of DPDK. So what uh, what makes uh, DPDK special? DPDK was born uh, with the aim to provide high speed uh, networking uh, with commodity CPU. It employs some techno uh, techniques to achieve the goal. Uh, these techniques uh, greatly reduce the overhead in uh, traditional networking application. Uh, as we just mentioned, the drivers in DPDK uh, typically work in pulling mode. Uh, so uh, in high in high IO throughput uh, scenarios, pony mode have uh, the has the advantage over interrupt mode as there are less context context switches. And similarly, context switch overhead is uh, further reduced when the driver works in user mode where where the applications uh, runs in so the kernel user overhead can be uh, can be reduced and the uh, thread affinity setting helps on this as well uh, when processing with uh, massive packets good amount of memory is used so lookup failure in translation table will cause CPU cycles being wasted. To mitigate this, uh, DBTK set up packet buffer based on memory that uh, allocated with huge page size. Uh, with less pack, uh, with less pages uh, 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 involved, uh, less translation table lookup failure will happen. And another performance limitation uh, comes from uh, concurrency. Okay, processing uh, involves, uh, processing often involves uh, writers and uh, readers. The writers and readers typically run on different CPU cores. Uh, they need to synchronize uh, with each other when processing on shared data. DBTK introduces a uh, log-free communication to mitigate the overhead um, synchronization. We will talk about these details uh, later. And on data path, uh, network devices are interfaced using PCI. Uh, DBTK implements uh, bulk mode IO operations to save the PCI transaction overhead. Now let's look uh, at uh, DBTK from an uh, ARM point of view um, to see the general status. Uh, as mentioned in uh, previous introduction, the framework uh, supports various architectures. And it runs on ARM platform as well. ARM V8 architecture is actively, actively maintained, um, both ARC 64 and ARC 32 <laughs> are supported. Uh, in distribution build, earning ARM V8A ISA inst structure, uh, instruction set architecture is required. Uh, this makes sure that the build can run on any ARM V8 hardware. The project also uh, has tailored configuration to support uh, some CPU IPs and uh, SOCs uh, from ARM as well as uh, ARM partners. The tailored configuration provide uh, optimal performance when building for specific uh, specific uh, target. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, regarding the network uh, inf interface card, the mainstream, mainstream cards are supported by PMD drivers. Index on ARM servers uh, were measured good performance, and the work on performance improvement is continuing. And CI/CD for ARM architecture has been integrated 
this ensures uh, code quality on ARM platform with project evolving. Uh, DBTQ runs a community lab. There are ARM servers in the lab, which uh, verifies uh, uh, every patch that uh, sent to the community. Uh, develop, developer can also make use of uh, some cloud-based uh, uh, CI environment. Uh, if, if one has a uh, fork hosted on GitHub, and uh, this helps the developers uh, that have no ARM server hardware in reach. Okay, let's uh, let's see the ARM architecture features that have been enabled in DBDK. The first feature uh, is single instruction multi-data, as known as uh, vector processing. Neo is such an extension, uh, extension available on ARM v8 machines. I think many of you have uh, already know the vector processing. So I take uh, I take uh, Neo for example. It has uh, 128 bit reg uh, wide vector register. That is wider than the general purpose register. Each new register can be used to hold multiple elements. Here is an example with 32 bit elements. Each element in the vector uh, is uh, called a lane, and the operations will be done simultaneously on all the lanes. By this way, higher data throughput is achieved. Vector processing is used in uh, many, parts, um, many places in DBDK. Uh, here I took a code snippet from DBDK example. Uh, it swaps the uh, test MAC address and the source MAC address of a packet. This operation simulates response to an ingress packet. As we know, MAC address is 48 bit long. So test MAC and the source MAC together take 96 bits. They fit into a single neon register. So the swap process will be load, load test MAC and the source MAC into neon register. And uh, then use table lookup to, sh uh, to shuffle the MAC, MAC bytes. Finally, store the shuffled data back. Uh, that's it. And this can be done on multiple packets in parallel as multiple um, new registers are available. And the SVE is a next generation of vector processing. It has the advantage of uh, vector length agnostic programming. And which allows uh, code to run on hardware with different vector register lengths. It also provides uh, useful operations like uh, gather load and uh, scatter store. Uh, there are a couple of uh, use cases in driver as well as libraries, but more details is not included in today's talk. Next. Next, let's look at uh, something about barriers. As we talked in DBDK novelty part, uh, lock-free programming is introduced to reduce uh, overhead on um, synchronization. In a typical message passing scenario, writer and a reader open on sh uh, shared data. Writer prepares data when send a flag, uh, prepares shared data, then set a flag to notify that the data is ready and the reader checks on the flag to decide whether data is ready. Uh, let's call the flag as a guard variable. Since ARM architecture's memory model is a weakly ordered operation on shared data and the guard variable can be observed in an order different from the program order. Such reordering is uh, something that must, must be prevented to ensure correct logic. 
so here is where barrier should be introduced. The simplest solution is to use DMB. DMB is a data memory barrier. With DMB, all load and store operations below the barrier will be observed in program order after the load and store operations above the barrier. Uh, that is to say, uh, observe the memory operations uh, will be load stores above and the load store below. This ensures uh, the uh, algorithm logic. DMB barrier is effective, but uh, it's, it is not efficient. It blocks memory access on both sides to be speculatively executed. And the C++ 11 memory order memory model is defined in finer uh, memory orderings. They are uh, they are more friendly to ARM architecture. So let's see uh, what is different here with uh, C++ 11 memory model. Acquire and the release semantics are provided. When load operation is executed with acquire semantic, it blocks other load and store after this load to be observed before the load. However, load and store above this load has no such constraint. And similarly, in the store operations, with the release semantic, it requires load and the store above this store to be observed earlier, but but no such requirement on the following load and stores. So uh, so we find the main difference: load and the store with acquire and the release. This semantics only confines reordering from one side. We call it uh, one-way barrier. One-way barrier allows more speculative operations. So it makes uh, more use of CPU cycles. The key part to use one-way barrier is to find out the guard variable. Writer prepares shared data, then set set guard variable with release semantic. While reader load the guard variable with acquire semantic, then access shared data when available. Okay, next feature uh, in our talk is LSE. Uh, LSE introduces a set of uh, atomic introductions, uh, inter in instructions, and compare and uh, swap, and uh, uh, load a store uh, load a store with some operations. This helps on system with large number of calls when atomic operations is involved. In DBDK, LSE was enabled in two ways. First, uh, for distribution build, a flag is added, uh, outline atomics. This flag uh, uh, is used because uh, in distribution build, we only requires basic ARM V8 instruction set to make sure the binary will run on any ARM V8 platform. But with the uh, uh, outline atomics flag, LSE instructions will be used when binary is running on a hardware with LSE extension, thus yield better performance. On another side, LSE instructions are directly used in project code. Here I posted an example of using CASP to implement 128-bit CS operation. 
CS is always uh, is often used in log free algorithms when multiple writers contending to update and share the data. The 128 bit CS operation uh, here is used in imp implementation of log free stack. And uh, uh, yeah, there are more features enabled in DBTK. That is uh, WFE with for event. With WFE is something that we monitoring on the memory, and when the memory is changed, their uh, event will be triggered, and the monitor will be notified. The typical use case of WFE is in lock, because in a lock imp implementation. Uh, uh, a thread that wants to take the lock uh, usually wait, spin to wait for the lock or yield the processor for other threads to run. Uh, with the WFE implementation, uh, the CPU call can enter into standby mode. This saves power. And also, the without uh, Without uh, more access to memory, the memory bandwidth will be saved, and uh, also the traffic on interconnect will be less. And uh, there are uh, crypto extensions integrated in DBDK because, uh, as we just said, DBDK also support uh, other accelerators. And uh, yeah, there are crypto accelerators uh, that we use some AES and uh, SHA instructions. And there are also uh, CRC instructions used in some uh, some cases as uh, checksum. And uh, yeah, next, uh, uh, there are more features to be enabled on DBDK, and they are on de development. One is about uh, DGH, the data gathering hint. This is a hint to the CPU to close any gathering. In the network uh, applications, this can this can improve the latency of uh, of packet. And there are also load acquire release consistency with processor consistent LRCPC. As we introduced uh, earlier, uh, it is a uh, it is a model of uh, RCSC release consistent uh, sequentially consistency. In that scenario, the the store release. Uh, yeah, the load acquire cannot be reordered with uh, with previous store release, but in uh, RCPC release consistency processor consistent consistent uh, model, uh, the load acquire on a different variable can be reordered before a store release on different variable. And there are also extension about a random number generator. Because DBTQ also uh, use some uh, random numbers with this instruction, the random. Uh, we can. Get random number more quickly. These are some some features in development. OK, uh, yeah, that's that's all. For me, I think that time slot is already finished. Okay, so I will close the sharing and uh, turn it to another presenter.
Hi, uh, Rick. Robin, are you ready? Or I'm not sure which of you is presenting this next part. Uh, it's me. Just uh, okay. getting my together. Just a minute, please. Great. Thanks. Do you guys see this? Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. All right. Sorry. Super. So I'll just start. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, this is an introduction to virtualization on ARM's new mixed criticality focused Cortex R82 processor. Um, so the, the original idea was for Wei Chen to present this, but unfortunately he's not able to make it. So I'm stepping in uh, and I'm supported by Penny and I'll do a bit of an intro in, in a minute. The, the idea is to go through this um, outline. Uh, some personal intros, essential background, an overview of virtualization. We are doing virtualization with Zen, so I just want to quickly touch on that and then talk about uh, Linux distribution viewpoints. So super quick, personal introductions. Wei is based in Shanghai. He's part of the automotive and industrial solutions team. Uh, the focus of the team is vehicle autonomy control and safety paradigms. He is the co-lead for the Zen component in the team. Penny is also based in Shanghai. She's also part of the team, and she's developed some of the core um, architectural support in Zen for this V8R64 architecture. Uh, and she's uh, pushing out uh, interesting patches to the to the lists. Uh, and me, I'm Robin Ranthava. I'm based in Cambridge uh, in UK. I'm the architect for the ACE team, and I'm generally looking at software standardization and safety related IP. Okay. So from the standpoint of essential background, um, so you know, like the the, the V eight R architecture and its implementations um, are as follows. Um, basically, like I should probably change this to uh, just V R actually, because in the tables over here, which I've removed from some documentation, uh, what you see is not just V eight R, but V seven R all the way to V eight R, right? So the columns are all the processor implementations that we've done, which are to do with the Cortex R profile and the uh, um, the VXR architecture, right, seven or eight. So um, the, the key takeaway is that um, this architecture profile was designed to support use cases that have a high sensitivity to deterministic execution. And chances are, if you look at a car, for example, the so fuel injection, brake control, drivetrain, all of that is done using um, implementations of the R architecture profile. Yeah, and and um, the reason this profile is associated with deterministic kind of use cases is because implementations of this architecture, such as the ones in, 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 in the tables above, they have features which are actually uh, which lend themselves to deterministic operations so in order pipelines, uh, not using translations for uh, you know memory regimes, tightly coupled memories, which are like you know typically single access, single cycle access memories for code and data. And simplified cache hierarchies, and very critically, dual core lock stepping capability, which is a, an interesting defense to um, transient forwards, right? Which is another topic in itself. So yeah, the takeaway here is that you know, like that this architecture profile is synonymous with deterministic operation. Um, yeah, so there's been um, V7R the architecture, and now there's the um, V8R architecture, which which has also been around for a while. But the architecture progression truly is ARM V7R, which was 32-bit oriented, ARM V8R ARCH32, and then now ARM V8 ARCH64, right? So basically when we went from V7R to V8R, there were a bunch of additional features added. So there was an exception model that was made compatible with the V8A architecture profile, which is synonymous with very beefy um, high performance cores, the kind you find in smartphones and uh, clamshells and even enterprise uh, grade machines. The one interesting thing that was added in the jump from um, V7R, um, actually this happened in, in, at, the late at, at the late end of the ARM V7R uh, cycle. It, it happened with some implementations there as well, but uh, virtualization support was added, but not the kind of virtualization that you associate with, um, with KVM, etc. right? Uh, this is like virtualization that allows you to run um, software that's designed to run without the presence of an MMU, so using a memory protection unit. 
right? So that was added. And now where we are today is we have this new ARM um, V8R AR64 architecture, right? So this adds support for the 64-bit A64 instructions and everything before this was 32. And you have a wider um, physical addressing potential. Um, you've got options for ARM Neon Advanced SIMD instructions. You now have three exception levels. We'll talk a lot more about this, but uh, you've got Secure EL2, that's the highest privilege for firmware and hypervisors. You've got EL1 for rich OSs, uh, which uh, require MMUs and translations, um, or RTOSs, uh, which don't typically. And uh, you have Secure EL0 for application workloads, right? So the, the interesting thing is that we now have optional support for virtual memory system architecture, which means that you can now run rich operating system uh, kernels like Linux either bare metal or as a guest, right? So um, the interesting thing is that V8R64 is, is in many ways kind of similar to V8A64, and that was by design, um, but it also has some significant differences, right? So uh, unlike V8A, there's only a single security state. So there's no secure and non-secure partitioning. Everything is deemed secure. And there are very good reasons for why that was um, the approach taken, um, but that's a really long story. So I <laughs> reach out to me separately if you want to know about that. So there, um, also the highest exception level in V8A is EL3, which is where you run monitor code. Um, you don't have an EL3, you have an EL2 and that's mandatory. So secure EL2 is the highest exception level. Um, you've got um, the A64 ISA, as I mentioned, small set of well-defined differences from the V8A A64 ISA. And you've got this protected memory system architecture-based virtualization, right? So normally you would associate virtualization with stage two translation using a stage two MMU. But over here, we actually have a stage two MPU, right? So um, I won't go into the details of some of the LPA aspects, etc. cetera, but uh, the, the key takeaway here is that uh, you've got PMSA virtualization and you've got ways to kind of uh, leverage um, kind of expression for memory access attributes, etc. Instead of descriptors associated with VMSA, you do that in descriptors associated with PMSA using an MPU. Right? Um, so when you're running guests, uh, whether the guests should run in PMSA with MPUs or whether it should run with VMSA with MMUs is configurable. Okay. So that was all architecture. Now let's talk about implementation. So Cortex R82 is the, the product name of the processor, which is an implementation of the ARM V8R AR64 architecture. So everything I said about the architecture applies over here. Single secure state, three exception levels, PMSA at EL2. Uh, you've got 32 protection regions. Uh, EL1 implements both VMSA and PMSA. Um, you have the ability to um, interface with the Geek V3.2 compliant uh, interrupt controller. You've got private caches uh, per core. You've got a shared a unified L2, and you have a determinism-oriented microarchitecture. I'll, I'll go into a little bit of detail on this later, right? But yeah, you can have multiple cores, clusters of uh, well, multiple clusters, all of that stuff. So the kind of software compositions, uh, when we kind of think about the possible software compositions, we have to, of course, consider the legacy use of the V8R architecture profile. The V8R architecture profile would be used for, you know, some people just run a bare metal application, right? They don't care about firmware, they don't care about operating systems, they just run one application. Motor control is the one interesting uh, area where Cortex-R processors are synonymous with use. Uh, so we want to support that, right? Um, and then there are people who have bare metal apps, but they rely on ARM and other vendors to provide uh, firmware, which is with standardized interfaces for certain operations. So, you know, that, that's the second kind of composition we want to target. And then there's the more common one where, you know, you have an RTOS around. And if you have an RTOS around, some people would run an RTOS bare metal without firmware, but it's more commonplace to actually have a firmware layering. Then you've got the app stack on top. So that's the third composition. And then uh, you've got people who um, may want to run a rich operating system, right? Um, just by itself. Uh, but but the, the focal point for us is actually this composition five, which is like, you know, using a hypervisor to put all of the previous compositions uh, more or less in virtual machines on top of this, because that gives us the ability to kind of like have a super sec and um, 
kind of like use that as a basis for you know like servicing all the other compositions as needed. So quick overview of virtualization um, on Cortex R82. So the idea is that you can have a hypervisor. The, in our case, it's Zen. I'll come to that uh, a, little, a bit later. And it's using MPUs, right? Uh, which is significantly different from what Zen would do normally. And you have the ability to run multiple guests. Either you have guests that are pinged to separate physical cores, or you have time division multiplexing of these uh, VMs on the same core or fewer cores, right? Uh, but you got like the, the theory is that you have one virtual machine that runs your safety critical stuff, like you know an RTOS uh, or bare metal application, right? With with very high uh, sensitivity to deterministic operation. And then you have another VM that actually runs your rich operating system like Linux, which could be doing human machine interfaces or in vehicle infotainment or some machine learning stuff that uh, you want to run in the downtime of the hard toss, those kind of things. So um, yeah, so so you basically have the ability to run PMSA VMs right, with MPUs um, at EL1 for the hard toss. Or you've got VMSA VMs at EL1 using the MMU for each operating systems. And you need to run a PMSA virtualization capable type 1 hypervisor at EL2. You don't have any VMSA at EL2, so you completely eliminate the, the overheads of the second stage translation regime that you have in V8A. So there are no DLB misses. There's no need to do a PhD blue work at stage two. But the really interesting thing is this, right? The microarchitecture in Cortex R82 is designed to promote deterministic RTOS guest operation even when a Linux case is present. What I mean here is that the microarchitecture has been designed to do things like, imagine if Linux is running and user space or the kernel made a virtual address reference and that virtual address reference need, need a translation. You look up in the DLB, you miss there and the hardware starts doing a page table walk. At this instance or somewhere up to this instance, um, there's an interrupt that comes in that was actually uh, targeting the, the RTOS VM, which is currently scheduled out. Uh, the microarchitecture has been designed to guarantee a worst case upper bound um, for, from the point in time where the page table walk was suspended through to when the, the RTOS interrupt gets a chance to run. And the it guarantees that uh, servicing that translation will, will happen uh, without impacting anything. When the, the rich operating system runs again, uh, it'll find the translation. Right? And uh, that, that's actually a really cool aspect of this particular implementation. Right? So um, apart from that, like fundamentally virtualization is, is the same, like, like you normally have on, on V8A even. What I mean is uh, you can set up the processor to say that, you know, if software running at EL1 or EL0 performs an out of bound access, like uh, access to a system control register that it shouldn't have access to, then that will cause a trap to EL2. If you try to uh, access something that's out of bounds from an address based standpoint, as programmed in the in the translation story with MPUs, that will cause a trap to EL2, right? So, and that's the basis for implementing hypervisors over here. So, but the challenges are that you know, like uh, this is different, right? Um, there's no MMU at EL2, so uh, type one hypervisors cannot use virtual addressing with address translation over there. So, you'll have to change. Um, everything's flat. The runtime addresses are the same as the link time addresses. You now have to use the MPU memory region descriptors at EL2 for specifying the uh, permissions and access attributes for the VMs running at lower yields. There's no uh, stage two translation at EL1. I won't go into all those details, but um, the entire PMSA story is predicated upon the use of these memory protection units, which in turn have these memory protection regions, and you are constrained by the number of memory protection region your processor implementation has. So architecturally, you can have up to 256, but typical processor implementations like the Cortex are ready to have 32. So that causes some interesting uh, kind of uh, trade-offs, um, such as the hypervisor running at EL2 needs to have memory regions to protect accesses to itself. Um, and but you also have uh, guests that you need to kind of like use MPU memory regions for, right? Uh, protection regions. So there's some careful consideration required. So yeah, uh, I just want to quickly say, you know, why do we use Zen? Um, I thought that might be of interest in this forum, right? Um, the, the group that that um, I'm involved with, and um, the, all of us, all the presenters are. Um, 
uh, that's like to do with the, the, the safe, safety is a very high emphasis, right? And um, stuff like KVM is not used over there. Uh, type two hypervisors aren't used because they have a really large trusted computing base. So we needed the type one hypervisor and there were a number of options, but when we tried to build a matrix of features such as these, um, Zen really was the, the, the best option for us, right? So safety ecosystem is synonymous with type one. We wanted to use a type one hypervisor that had both ends of the virtualization spectrum in terms of features. So you've got static partitioning, think jailhouse, etc., but also dynamic resource partitioning, think KVM, right? So, um, and we needed a hypervisor with uh, like a, a good kind of uh, existing support for ARM. And we needed one which was interesting, but also had a vibrant community. There's a number of really interesting options which don't have a big enough community. And for that, for us, that's really important because we want to use this as a basis to kind of get interesting design patterns around the ARM architecture out, right? So why not KVM? I, I said previously that you know KVM is, is it's, it's not type one. The trusted compute base is too large. Um, and KVM is fundamentally designed to work with the VMSA at EL2, right? Which means that in order to get KVM to run, there would be some major surgery required and polite um, kind of reach outs to the right people in the ARM KVM community have made it clear that, you know, that's not really going to happen. So theoretically, of course, it's possible, but it's, it's not really going to get accepted and therefore it's not really worth doing. So that's our position on this. Um, yeah, so where are we with Zen all said and done? Um, um, Penny has been instrumental in, in implementing a lot of this stuff. So we modified Zen to uh, match ARM Vieta's uh, 64's requirements. Uh, so now Zen is like one of the few open source hypervisors that actually knows how to deal with PMS. I should have pointed out that uh, proprietary hypervisors have been doing this for a while, right? Uh, but um, open source, there are there are options, but they are actually sparingly few, right? So, so we've added um, MPU support to Zen's memory management system. There's this construct in Zen called P2M, which does guest virtual address to physical address translation. That's been extended. Uh, the context switch bits are extended appropriately. Patches have been sent upstream. Discussions are underway. There's subtleties being discussed, and I'm sure they'll be resolved in due course of time. There are some hard problems to solve with inter-VM communication, virtual device support. Uh, and ultimately, we do want to support the AR32 portion of the ARM V8 story, right? So that people who have Cortex-R52, for example, um, can, can also use this stuff. And there is appetite for that. So Linux distribution viewpoint, this is an interesting one, right? So what we're trying to do, and it's an ongoing conversation, is understand what the standardization pressure is for implementations like Cortex-R82, I mean software standardization pressure. The, the bit that we want to try and get good answers to, right, is are people going to be using this in tightly controlled environments where, the, where you know, like software standardization value takes a bit of a backseat because you don't really run multiple um, implementations of software from multiple suppliers, right? So everything is locked down and fixed. So if, if that's the case for the majority of the uptake of this uh, architecture and implementations, then, you know, like going down software standardization is a very expensive activity, right? I mean, I know this out of experience. So uh, it's not that we are not doing it. The conversations internally are all underway, but how far it gets is going to be predicated upon uh, of this feedback cycle with the proprietary hypervisor, software vendors, tier one OEMs in the automotive space, and similarly in the industrial space. Right? Um, but the, the standards that are in focus are things like EBBR and things like system ready IR, both of which are um, typically well known to Linux distribution vendors because they rely on those standards to be uh, adhered to by software. Um, in order to make seamless Linux kernel boot possible, in order to make seamless power control possible, bringing a processor up, secondary processor, tearing it down, those kind of things. And it will shape boot protocols for RTOSs, for rich operating systems, for hypervisors, bare metal, guests, all of that stuff. So yeah, uh, I suppose the takeaway from this one is we welcome viewpoints. Uh, so if there are any views, any uh, angles on this, please do reach out. 
is quite vital. I think the Cortex R82 is fundamentally ushering in uh, a new era in in, in in all of the areas associated with um, V8R, VXR in the past, right? Um, so now you have interesting options where you can actually do mixed criticality without uh, putting in, you know, like uh, uh, an MMU enabled beefy processor to run Linux. There are other options now. So that's pretty much all I had. Um, I don't know whether you guys want to do questions now or later, but uh, let me know. Thank you, thank you, thank you Robin, for the pre very interesting presentation, and thank you also to the colleague who spoke earlier. I would now invite questions from the audience. Um, feel free to either uh, unmute yourself and ask away, or type in the chat. I will read them. So I'll give uh, a few moments uh, to the audience to organize their thoughts and uh, and ask question. Okay, I've got one. Uh, I meant to ask when you preempted the Linux guest doing a page table walk with the RTO Artos guest. Uh, this this is done by changes in the scheduler of the type one hypervisor, right? Correct. I mean, to be fair, we haven't really changed the scheduler specifically for this, um, but we are conscious that there may be some uh, interesting kind of, um, from a real-time scheduling standpoint, modifications needed to the type one hypervisor. And on our roadmap, in the context of Zen, uh, we want to explore this more. Uh, but today we've got like um, Zephyr and Linux VMs running over here and um, we haven't made any specific changes to the type one hypervisor. I see. Uh, a follow-up question would be, well, this is about balancing requirements. You will basically pay for performance for throughput, by throughput, uh, to gain predictability. So mm -hmm. this is, I guess, favor a favorable trade, right? Yes. Um, it also brings with it uh, undoubtedly uh, complications, right? Um, interestingly, in, in many safety deployments, um, you only really want to bring a rich operating system into the mix for use cases that don't end up compromising shared resources uh, with the RTOS. Not explicitly shared resources, but the implicitly shared ones. I mean, memory interfaces or coherency channels or whatever, right? So in many cases, people will say, actually, we appreciate the fact that we can have this, but we'd still like to have a separate cluster, perfectly isolated, right down to the interconnect, where we'll run Linux for throughput or whatever. <laughs> right? I see, so there I see. Is, yeah. Mm, thank you. Cool. You're welcome. Uh, I, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So uh, uh, I have a question. Could you name one of the other uh, open source hypervisors you were looking into? Apart For sure. Yeah. So um, I, I must clarify, right? So I generally look at a lot of open source ones, even without mixing that with the V8R64 story, right? So, uh, so let me kind of like give you both sides of the story. Right? So we looked at, um, generally speaking, when, when looking at um, open source hypervisors, and when I say look at, it means taking it into the labs, playing with it and qualifying it using a set of metrics that we maintain internally, right? So so things like Jailhouse, things like L4RE by Kern Concept, um, things like SEL4, another uh, L4 implementation, um, and yeah, and, and of course Zen. Um, the ones that uh, on the proprietary side that we look at, but to a limited extent, um, because we mostly do open source in this group, are Integrity, Bike OS from Cisco, and um, uh, Wind River stuff. 
So those are on the proprietary side. Now that was the general story, right? Now when, when I'm talking about V8 R64 specifically, the ones that we looked at were L4 RE, um, which I personally quite like in terms of its design. And it's also got good uptake in, in the kind of like the automotive universe, which, which I care about. Uh, and look, the, the, the models for V8 R64, the models for Cortex R82, a lot of this stuff is publicly available since forever, not forever, like for about a year. So people have been taking their um, proprietary and open source um, RTOSs, hypervisors, and getting them to work. So uh, the L4E guys, I believe, have done a port already to this, and they're able to run the microkernel based um, hypervisor on this. So that's an interesting one. Um, I believe there's a jailhouse port as well, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah. OK, thanks a lot. By the way, I mean, um, feel free to reach out to me by the side if, if you have questions. Um, send me an email or whatever. The email address is in the title. I will let a few other moments pass in case uh, any member of the audience uh, uh, is uh, thinking about any question. Uh, meanwhile, I renew. Oh, is there something in the chat? I think there's Andreas, I have a question Andreas. about uh, DPDK, yes. if I may, for uh, Roy Feng. So um, one theme that we've had uh, throughout the labs conference has been that of uh, testing. And maybe Robin also has some comments on that for the um, RM82 afterwards. So um, you've talked about some of the optimizations that have been done in the DPDK code base. But uh, when we are speaking about DPDK as a distro vendor, um, that kind of raises the question about um, what individual cards and in which way application or test suite wise exactly we could use to actually verify the um, code base. Do you have any um, comments or, you know, like ideas you might share with us there? So I'm going to have to do a pass on that one. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, Robert, uh, Robin, for you, the question would be um, there was a mention of the um, Simulator, I think you call it for um, R82, uh, not yet having the full support for, let's say, U-boot or other kind of standardized bootloaders to actually try booting um, our Linux on them. If you had any update on that afterwards, that might be interesting. Absolutely, yeah. So, so to be clear, um, we're kind of like approaching this from the standpoint of the software standardization ecosystem discussion needs to happen, but that shouldn't get in the way of software availability to help people kick the tires with this, right? So so today we've already released um, not something that has a U-boot and the complete story, but a, a software that allows you to boot Linux. Um, um, and, and we have a roadmap, as I know you're aware, Andreas, uh, with um, like an incremental set of features on top as in enable multi-core with Linux, bring U-boot into the mix, bring uh, standardized firmware into the mix, right? But yeah, so, so um, we want to keep the standardization story, which may turn into a very long one, um, intentionally running in parallel. Um, and by the way, even for the standardization stuff from a PSCI, EBPR standpoint, I mean, there's work happening already. Right? Yeah. Um, the other question is, is the original uh, Rui Feng still here? I'm it going looks to like he may have dropped off. Right. So um, I'll volunteer if you can, uh, actually I'll try and remember your question. Your question was, how do we verify this stuff? What are the cards? What is the hardware, right? Well, and more importantly, well, since uh, DPDK is more kind of a library, like, you know, like uh, how are we looking on any kind of uh, useful like test suite or test harness to verify that, uh, well, basically the full stack is working, including the acceleration. Got it, yeah. 
I'll, I'll articulate that. And um, if I'm not able to articulate properly, I'll make sure you're in a thread where we can get you an answer. 